uh, as Francis said, I, I, I'll, I'll talk um, predominantly about um, Forest Gate, but I, I, I will reflect a bit more on uh, a, a facility much closer to uh, to the church um, that uh, people may feel they know a little more about, or, or give them a, a greater understanding of of a building that they perhaps know from the outside quite well but uh, don't know very much about the history. So if you bear with me I'll just uh, go on to sh uh, screen sharing, make sure I can uh, uh, get to where we are and is that all fine? Can people see the, the, uh, the presentation? Uh, 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 sorry, Fra Francis, yeah. <laughs> you're the only person who can answer that question. It, it, it is, is the uh, the screen sharing up and running? It is indeed. I think. Yeah, okay, oh, great. Yeah. So, um, well, just simply, uh, I uh, Francis asked me to to come along and, and talk about East London <clears throat> workhouse schools um, in late in the late Victorian era, and although. Uh, Forest Gate and indeed Waltham Forest weren't in uh, what was uh, East London at the time. Uh, they were uh, very much affected by uh, these schools. Um, so my, my talk will be largely based on a book which uh, was published uh, about a month ago, um, which is predominantly about an institution in Forest Gate, although it is set within a, a, a national setting of child care or institutionalized child care in, in, in Britain almost since the um, uh, since the Norman conquest. Um, but as, as I was uh, suggesting just now, uh, in addition to talking about the Forest Gate Institution, I will talk a, 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 a little bit at, at the end um, a, a, about a place which is much closer to the church. So um, those of you who are familiar with the railway line running into Liverpool Street from Essex, almost halfway between the Forest Gate station and uh, the Maryland station, on your right hand side, you can't quite see it, but it's probably uh, no more than 100 yards away from the railway line. This building lurks on the right hand side and that is the subject of most of what I'm going to be talking about tonight. 50,000 East End children from the age of 2 to 14 years old were resident there from um, 1854 to 1907. In 1907 it was closed as a school and became a maternity hospital. Um, where another 50,000 East Enders were born and maybe some of tonight's audience or friends or relatives were born there in, in what then became the, uh, the Forest Gate Maternity Hospital. That was closed uh, in, in 1986 when Newham General Hospital was uh, opened for the first time and effectively took over the maternity uh, provision in, 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 in the borough of Newham. And my book really is the story of the years from 1854 or of, of that institution. Uh, and as I said, set against the national uh, background. Now, just um, by way of historic background, I mean, and of course, this is particularly relevant since it's a, a church community largely that I'm speaking to. Since the, um, the Norman Conquest, the, the relief of poverty in Britain was pretty much left to the church to, uh, to administer uh, and, until well into the, the 19th century. Um, uh, and poor people would often end up at the doors of monasteries, abbeys and so on. Arms would be given uh, by those... Um, by the the religious communities and um, yeah, it, it was never regarded as being a state function to look after the poor. 
it was almost part of the charitable arm of the church, which it seemed fairly willing to do so. Until, of course, the 16th century, Henry VIII comes along, dissolves the monasteries, hands them or sells them over to um, largely his mates. Um, and so a principal part of looking after the poor, the, the poor at the gate of the monastery, was, was, was um, withdrawn. And there was, it was almost... A, a, a chaos but um there was no institution recognized institutional form of poverty relief until the early 17th century when uh, various uh, early uh, poor law acts again effectively pushed the problem towards the church and uh the parish uh, became the center of the relief of poverty, you know, based on on the the, the territory of church parishes, parish councils, parish churches, overseers of overseers of poor were established. Uh, local uh, the early form of local rates was, was um, introduced in order to collect money from landowner landowners in the area, and it was the church or the the vestry that. Um, uh, looked after the poor. Now, th th this was okay in a sense um, when Britain was overwhelmingly a rural community from which few people strayed very far away from their, their home villages and towns. So the local poor, whether it was widows, orphans, uh, elderly people who'd fallen on hard times, unemployed and so on, were often reasonably well known within the parish and the uh, overseers of the poor would dispense charity um outdoor relief as it was known uh, often customized to meet the needs of of the people who who were in need of food clothing shelter and so on and that pretty much uh, operated until well, it did operate until the, 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 the early years of the 19th century. However, from the, the late 17th, uh, the late 18th century until the early years of the 19th century, th the three great um, uh, economic revolutions, I guess, um, began to uh, disrupt this system or, 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 or make it... Uh, pretty difficult to operate. Firstly, we've got the agricultural revolution where large numbers of people were effectively driven off the land. Uh, this was pretty much in tandem with that. We've got the, the transport revolution with the opening of canals, uh, later railways and a lot of turnpike roads. Um, and thirdly, the industrial revolution, which led to the, the fairly rapid growth of uh, of towns and cities and the combination of these three resulted in large numbers of uh, unemployed poor taking advantage of transport moving to towns in search if not of the, uh, the streets of gold certainly opportunities perhaps to get employment in and around industry uh, and uh, some of the the trades and uh, professions that, 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 that uh, grew up around uh, the Industrial Revolution. This actually caused uh, considerable uh, difficulties in towns and cities all over the place. Towns, cities grew enormously and the parish as a facility for addressing poverty was no longer uh, able to do so effectively. Um, large numbers of people poured in. London, for example, the second half of the, the, the 19th century, the population of London grew from 2 million to around 7 million. Enormous growth. Much of that growth was in the East End, where people had come pouring in from uh, to escape rural poverty from Essex, uh, East Anglia and so on. And they ended up in uh, East, East End parishes, 
Whitechapel, Stepney, etc., where the the the, the parishes, the, the churches were completely unable to deal with the enormous influx of uh, itinerant populations, many of whom were driven there. They didn't have uh, adequate uh, accommodation. They didn't have proper uh, permanent jobs. They were, uh, I suppose, the 19th century equivalent of the gig economy. Uh, I, I, I guess people know most of all about uh, the docks where people were hired by the hour, the half day and so on. There was no continuity of employment. And these parishes in East London were, in particular, were completely able to, uh, unable to cope with this influx, which led uh, to the 1834 Poor Law Amendment Act, which I guess many people will have heard of, which uh, introduced boards of guardians, primitive forms of local authorities, um, which were responsible for the relief of poverty uh, all over the country. And with them came perhaps for the first time, well, for the first time, um, the introduction of workhouses on a large scale. Prior to 1834, some of the, uh, the old ecclesiastical parishes had small workhouses, uh, but you know, often only for 20 or 30 people. I guess in Waltham Forest, uh, people will know the, the Vestry Museum in, in, in Walthamstow, which was a, an, an early pre-Poor um, Law Amendment Act workhouse probably only accommodate 20 or 30 people families um often in in in, in cramped con uh, accommodation but the employer the, the explosion of of uh, population particularly in east london areas meant that fairly massive workhouses were built in order to accommodate large numbers of uh destitute people. This photo here was, uh, sorry, this etching here was from uh, an artist called Gustav uh, Gore, uh, who um, uh, sketched in living conditions in East London in the 1870s. And this was a street in Whitechapel, which gives you an indication of many people living in the street, clearly poverty, insanitary conditions, life on the street was pretty dreadful. The only alternative for many of these people was the workhouse, Whitechapel's workhouse, which is now in what is now Valence Road, um, was one of the largest in London, seven, eight hundred uh, people there at any given time. The fact that these people continued to live in the, on, on the street rather than go to the workhouse is indicative of the conditions in the workhouse which were operated on what were uh, the, the um, brains behind the 1834 Poor Law Amendment Act uh, called the Less Eligibility Principle. In other words, they saw poverty as the, co the, the cause of poverty as being the indolence of the poor rather than any economic or institutional causes and said that the only reason that people were poor was because they... Uh, they wouldn't work or they weren't prepared to work at low enough wages. There was plenty of work there. If only they would cut their pay rates, they would find work. So it was indolence that led to poverty rather than a uh, lack of employment. So conditions in workhouses were made uh, driven under what the, the less eligibility criteria, whereby those inhabiting the workhouse were expected to live in conditions worse than those uh, of the poorest outside them. Now given the fact that the poorest outside them may have been living in the on the streets, uh, were destitute, couldn't afford food, uh, other forms of humiliation were um, poured on people uh, to make them uh, uh, or, 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 as a disincentive for them to go into the workhouse. The fact that people in, the, in, in, in photos like this, etchings like this, prefer to stay on the street rather than go to the workhouse is indicative 
of the dreadful conditions. They were given back-breaking work. Families were separated. They were fed dreadful food um, and um, humiliated in pretty awful ways, appalling uniforms and so on. And of course, many uh, readers of Dickens will be very well aware of this. Some of the East End uh, workhouses got so big that the uh, boards of guardians, those running them, uh, began to look for solutions for the children to try to separate them from what they saw as the indolence of their parents, the corrupting influence of poverty, and so began to look to build children's workhouses um, outside of uh, the main ones, um, uh, specifically for young people. And this was built here in 1854, the, uh, the building I was showing earlier on, uh, by initially by the workhouse, uh, the um, Whitechapel workhouse. And it was built to accommodate their, their children uh, from the ages of two and to the ages of 14 to 15. The children were taken away from the workhouse parents, uh, whether they liked it or not, uh, and sent here, um, uh, where, where they lived in conditions not unf uh, uh, dissimilar to those in the workhouse. They were let, uh, they were locked up here. They couldn't get out. Um, it was effective. It, it, it's what uh, modern day sociologists would call an, a total institution. Uh, conditions there were similar to those in prisons. Um, the only crime of the inhabitants here uh, being the fact that they were born into the poverty of their parents. Whitechapel built this school in 1854. Fairly soon afterwards, the boards of guardians in Hackney and Poplar saw this as an institution they wished to, to uh, take advantage of and uh, paid a weekly fee to, uh, to Whitechapel in order to send their children here. Um, so although it was a school, it was called a, uh, a, a, a school, uh, there were up to 900 children living in this place at, at, uh, by the 1860s. It was grossly overcrowded. It had originally only been built for around 600 and the uh, controlling authorities white the Whitechapel and then later Hackney and Poplar Boards of Guardians weren't interested in the the welfare of their children particularly they sought um, uh, uh, or they, they looked after the interests of the ratepayers who were overwhelmingly the, the wealthier people in their parishes and people who were completely unlikely either themselves or their, their, their own children to, to end up in institutions like this. So the, the, the ratepayers overwhelmingly were interested in saving money rather than the, uh, the care of their, their, their children. This is a photo that uh, Henrietta Barnett, who I'll speak of uh, in, in a while, took of the girls there in the 1890s. Uh, so they were there from the age of, of two, their heads were shaved, as you can see, they were pretty, pretty dull uniforms. Siblings were separated as soon as they entered the institution and often wouldn't see each other until they left um, age 14 or 15. Parental visits were limited to two hours every quarter, every three months. The food was dull and barely adequate. These were the girls pictured in the 1890s. These were boys pictured at the same time. The place was not run by anybody with any uh, educational or childcare qualifications, background or experience. It was run by ex-soldiers uh, on military disciplined lines. There was lots of uh, well-documented cases of brutality, which I uh, spell out in the book quite a bit, physical violence to the children, 
class sizes in the so-called school were running at 90 and upwards uh, and uh, supervised usually by untrained teachers. Uh, the untrained teachers were expected to uh, teach pretty basic three R's plus religion. Religion was a big uh, part of the syllabus. And after school hours to effectively act as child mind as the other 16 hours of the day. Everything in the institution was done in silence in the schools. Whenever they moved around, they ate in a communal area in total silence. Whenever activities were moved from one to the other, from getting up to washing to having breakfast to going to school, it was preceded by a school bell and the children were expected to go from one activity to the other uh, in total silence. Some of these places were often referred to as industrial schools, giving the impression that the children were taught skills with which they could use on leaving the institution uh, to get work um, uh, from from their, their, their mid-teens onwards. Uh, this was a myth. Um, the school, the, 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 the so-called uh, in, industrial skills that they were given were minimal to non-existent. They were condemned frequently by poor law school inspectors. What the children effectively did was to provide very basic skivvying activities to reduce the demand for paid labour in the institution. So the girls would spend hours scrubbing the floors, the boys would spend hours sewing, uh, repairing the uniforms, digging the, the gardens and so on. There were the, and they were all done on such huge scales that they didn't actually learn the kind of skills that would be required in in post-school life. So although the the girls were taught or, or were, 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 were given crudely uh, domestic skills, uh, scrubbing floors for an institution with 900 was hardly uh, adequate preparation for domestic service that, 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 that many of them would end up with. So this was these were the conditions within the schools <coughs> within the school by the 1870s it had grown enormously hugely um, overcrowded and the the governors of the school saw a cheap way out of trying to provide provide additional accommodation and in doing so stumbled across the one uh, good thing to have come out of the the um, the Forest Gate District School which was a training ship called the Goliath. This, this, uh, the the school got a, a ship from the um, a redundant ship from from the Admiralty. He sighted it in Grays in Essex and was able to to send up to a couple of hundred uh, boys there to be trained as would be sailors. Um, many of these went on to have successful careers in the Royal and merchant navies afterwards, led by an extremely uh, inspiring, very, very effective, efficient and caring superintendent, a guy called uh, William Sutherland Bouchier. Um, it was the great success of the Forest Gate School. Unfortunately, it burnt down, the ship burnt down within five years. Um, and all but 22 of the 400 children or four boys on board escaped, largely a result of good drills uh, and the fact they'd been taught to swim. Um, Boucher was then recommissioned, not by the Forest Gate School, but by London-wide authority to continue running a training ship in Greys, uh, which he continued to do in the till the 20th century. So this was this was the one highlight of the um, uh, the Forest Gate School, but it was short lived. It only lasted four years, uh, five, five years before it burnt down. The school was run uh, entirely by men, ex military men. Uh, the 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 the, the, um, the superintendents were a succession 
of ex-military men. The governors were all men, all male. The work at the um, boards of guardians uh, that sent the governors there were all male uh, without um, any empathy for the needs of the children. And the overwhelming, dem uh, the overwhelming uh, driving force, as I've indicated earlier on, of these men was to, to save on the rates rather than to look after the needs of the children. Two quite extraordinary women, however, uh, came to have a, a, a big impact on the school in the 1870s. On the left is a woman called Jane Senior. She became Britain's first female civil servant and was appointed to um, the uh, the Poor Law Board uh, and later the uh, the, the uh, well uh, to, to the Poor Law Board to examine uh, these poor law schools. Particularly, uh, she was asked to look at them from the uh, position of the girls who were attending them, and she wrote this report in 1870, which was incredibly condemnatory of. The conditions that the, that the girls faced. Um, she complained about their lack of the lack of care, affection uh, 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 that they uh, suffered, and said that the, the conditions they had were so appalling that these were not ideal circumstances, far from ideal circumstances for would-be future mothers. So when these children left school, many of them would go in and drift into um, domestic service, but many of themselves would become uh, mothers and hadn't experienced any of the kind of maternal skills or uh, nurturing that would uh, be required for themselves as mothers. So Senior was, was um, an advocate of uh, introducing a, a, a much more civilised, humane and caring um, attitude within the schools like the, uh, the Forest Gate one. Her report was poo pooed by the Ministry uh, in a very, very patronising way. Oh, what do you know? Um, you don't have the interests of the ratepayers at, uh, at, at, at heart. Uh, senior um, suffered uh, ill health, left the civil service um, and must have felt incredibly frustrated. However, uh, in the early 1870s, another quite remarkable woman came along and had a very direct impact on the Forest Gate School. And that is Henrietta Barnett, photo picture on the right. Barnett is probably best known <coughs> today for the school named after her in, in Hampstead. Uh, and it's there in Hampstead because uh, in the early 20th century, Barnet was the brains behind the establishment of um, Hampstead Garden suburb. Before this, however, in the 1870s, she she she'd been brought up in a in a a, a, a fairly prosperous middle class uh, household in in uh, in Surrey, but from a, a, a very caring, nurturing family and she and she married Samuel Barnett uh, when she was very young in her early 20s. Samuel Barnett had a very similar uh, middle class background uh, but they were both a determined social reformers. Samuel Barnett, Barnett was a vicar and he asked the Bishop of London to send him to the poorest parish he could find and in the 1871-72, the bishop sent them to, to Whitechapel, which he said was the, uh, the worst, poorest, most depraved uh, parish in London. The Barnets sat around uh, really having a, a pretty major impact in, in Whitechapel. They, among other things, uh, were behind a great deal of um, slum clearance there, which was... Uh, beneficial. They, in their later days there, um, established the Whitechapel Art Gallery because they wanted to bring crudely culture to the poor of the area. Um, they, uh, and, and, and uh, Samuel Barnett got himself elected to the 
Whitechapel Board of Guardians with a view to trying to improve conditions for the poor in the workhouses. And when he was there, he soon saw the conditions in the Forest Gate School and got his wife, Henrietta, onto the, the Whitechapel Board of Guardians and had her um, uh, placed as a governor of the, the school in, in Forest Gate. Uh, Barnett, Henrietta was only the second um, um, poor law guardian in the country um, and became the first female, uh, sorry, the first female, sorry, only the second female poor law guardian guardian in the country and the first female um, governor of a workhouse school in the country. She remained a governor at the Forest Gate School for 20 years. <clears throat> she, like Senior, uh, found herself incredibly patronised by all of her male colleagues who said that she didn't really understand that what these children needed was a bit of discipline uh, whipping into them so they were up to becoming uh, proper uh, law-abiding citizens who wouldn't be a drain on on the rates when they left school. Her, her um, argument, rather like seniors, was, look, if you treat them in total institutions when they leave, that's all they will know. They will not be fit to become citizens of the state in the future. We need to nurture them. We need to give them good conditions, we need to feed them, we need to teach them properly, we need to train them, we need to socialise them so that they become uh, good upstanding members of the future society. She um, didn't get very far with the Guardians uh, as a, an institutional board, but used to go along to the school, which was her right as a governor, and did a lot of things through the back door. So, I mean, quite ridiculously, she uh, had to had to stop the the matron of the school, a woman called uh, somewhat uh, implausibly uh, Miss, Miss Perfect, um, to, to actually start calling the children by their names rather than by numbers. Uh, she was able to introduce outside trips. The children weren't allowed out of the school at all. She used to take them up to Wanstead Flats, which was a, a highlight of their lives, just to get out. She managed to become, you know, to get some of her middle class friends to visit the school regularly, to talk to the children, to introduce books into the, the school, to introduce bits of entertainment. Uh, to introduce a library to bring uh, toys in and she was extremely well connected. She was able to raise money through an institution that she established for uh, getting hol holidays for, for, for children in the school. She got royal patronage for this, got quite a lot of money uh, in and was able to send a lot of the children out for week-long camping holidays in, in Essex, which may not sound desperately exhilarating to us today but this was an enormous breakthrough and like seniors she was concerned that many of the children who who left the school uh, many of the girls who left um, they left at 14 went into death, death, uh, domestic service where they were dreadfully abused many of them were dreadfully abused um, physically, sexually, and uh, in, in uh, just um, treated extraordinarily badly. So the, she, uh, following on from seniors work, set up an organization called the <coughs> Metropolitan Association for the Befriending of Young Servants, which effectively provided an aftercare service for girls leaving the school, so they got a, 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 an annual visit from people in their organisation until they were 21 to make sure that they weren't being um, badly, to, too badly treated uh, by their employers. If they were, I uh, tried to move them on to slightly more hospitable um, employers. So, so um senior uh, 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 sorry barnick did a great deal um under 
cover, if you like, to try to um, improve conditions for the children at the school. But uh, it, increasingly, it was ob became obvious to her that the problems weren't these almost or, or, or couldn't be solved by these piecemeal reforms the problems were institutional and they were about the way in which the, the, the place was structured run and the whole culture there in the 1890s two major events hit the school which led to huge public scandals which threw the school into the national uh, prominence for the first time or for the first time really firstly in 1890 there was a fire there um, on new year's eve 1890 uh, where 26 boys were um, uh, suffocated in their in their um, dormitory uh, as a result of the fumes from the fire. It only later transpired, uh, and it didn't particularly come out at the inquest, but um, Barnett uh, discovered this afterwards. The, the reason was that they were locked in their dormitory. It was New Year's Eve, so the staff could go out and celebrate New Year's Eve. Uh, so this, this was negligence. This was, today we would clearly call it corporate uh, uh, manslaughter but the, the those responsible for managing and running the school got no blame for this three years later there was a major uh, food poisoning outbreak at the school where uh, three children died and 150 suffered very seriously from food poisoning because uh, the managers of the school were corrupt they substituted a good food that was meant for the children, which they took away and sold and replaced it by quite literally maggot ridden food, which caused the food poisoning. Again, inquests were held into the deaths. Those responsible were not blamed. And by this time, Barnett was clear what was going on and saw that trying to get change from within the institution was impossible as i'd indicated earlier on she was extremely well uh socially connected her brother-in-law just so happened to be the editor of the british medical journal uh ernest hart and he she got him to run over a two-year period lots of articles condemning the public health conditions, the food poisoning, some of the diseases that went on, the lack of hygiene and so on in the schools. Uh, and this got a fair amount of um, publicity outside of the medical profession and it raised the profile of the school and uh, what these places were known as barrack schools, barrack schools like them. Her second uh, prong of attack was again calling on her contacts. She got a, a, um, a parliamentary committee established to examine these barrack schools under a former minister, a guy called Mandela, um, and his report in 1896 was condemnatory um, it dug in a lot deeper into some of the scandals at Forest Gate and other schools and said that these barrack schools were not fit for purpose needed to be uh, replaced by more humane more child-centric uh, institutions and Eventually, uh, the the government, the, the, the by now the board of uh, the uh, minister of education, the board of education, which was uh, uh, responsible for the schools and the the poor law board, accepted that these schools had to go. Uh, just very as a brief aside, following this fire in eighteen uh, in, in eighteen ninety. The 26 boys were buried in a, in a cemetery which is uh, adjacent to the school, the West Ham Cemetery, just at the back of the school. And today, a memorial largely ignored in the far corner of the cemetery uh, survives. Uh, 
um, this obelisk with the um, uh, plaque at the bottom, uh, remembering the, uh, the deaths of the, of the children. So follow, go back to the, the drift of the story, following the um, report of the Mandela uh, Committee and the British Medical Journal's uh, campaign, uh, the death knell was effectively um, poured on these barrack schools. In 1896, um, Henrietta Barnett's term of office as a governor of the school expired uh, and she left. But as she left by <laughs> the back door of the school, by an extraordinary coincidence, two uh, new governors entered the school by the front door uh, and these were uh, finished her work in a sense. They were two working class guardians. On the left, Will Crooks, who is perhaps lesser known than uh, George Lansbury on the right. Will Crooks um, was himself a workhouse school boy. Had he been born 20 years later, he would have uh, ended up in the Forest Gate School himself. Um, but his uh, experience in a, in a workhouse school in Sutton uh, was firmly etched on him and he spent his entire life railing against and trying to reform and get workhouse schools abolished. He, um, uh, he was an itinerant but um, he first came to public prominence in the 1889 London dock strike and it, it, uh, two years later <coughs> became one of the first working class people elected to the recently introduced London uh, County Council. When there he was able to get the qualifications for election to become a poor law guardian uh, changed to in a, effectively enable working class people to um, uh, to be eligible to stand. There was, a, there was a property qualification which was reduced so it was a, 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 a much wider electorate effectively. He and another local working class man, George Lansbury, uh, both became, uh, both got elected to Poplar Board of Guardians in 1893 and rapidly uh, became uh, Poplar representatives on the board of governors of the Forest Gate School. The two of them um, cut their public service teeth uh, really um, at the school. They um, picked up the mantle of um, Henrietta Barnett and worked tirelessly to get the school closed um, and to have the children transferred to altogether more suitable accommodation. They uh, sacked the superintendent or, and, and laid off a number of the staff as soon as they uh, got uh, in charge of the, the governors of the school, uh, were able incrementally to improve the food there, rooted out corruption, got rid of uniforms, uh, improved the training and it was their intention, it was their hope to stop the children having to go to the school and, uh, separated from the rest of the community uh, you know, my book is called Out of Sight, Out of Mind, because these children effectively were. The school was the, the largest institution in Forest Gate at this time, but almost nobody in the district knew about it. The local press uh, didn't cover it. In fact, the local uh, Chrysanthemum Society got more regular coverage in the, the local press than this school or its children. Um, they wanted to break down this barrier to get children out into society and so on. But most of all, they wanted to, to get rid of the, of the barrack-like conditions in the school. And so they set about trying to sell the school premises, which they were able to do. Um, and because Forest Gate was a, a burgeoning suburb um, brought along by industrialisation, by the growth of East London, by the railways and so on. 
they were able to get a reasonable price for the land, uh, which they e effectively sold to um, West Ham, uh, the West Ham Board of Guardians. But that's another story. They then set about trying to raise an additional £100,000 and got into enormous row with um, the guardians in Poplow who didn't want to waste money. There were parliamentary inquiries into how the money was being spent. They were accused of uh, fecklessness and so on. But what they were able to do after 10 years was to build this uh, in Brentwood. Uh, children's home known as the Hut, the, the Hutton Poplars, which were to set the standards for 20th century homes. The children went to local schools, untainted by uniform. Instead of being, they were in houses uh, with uh, where they lived in streets, instead of being run by ex-army sergeants, each of these houses was run by a house mother. Um, uh, who, whose main responsibility was to look after the care uh, and well-being of the children rather than the um, the funds of the ratepayers. Um, there were huge rows. The, there was a sort of nimbyism went round Brentwood because they didn't want um, scruffy East End hooligans and vagrants in their territory. So <clears throat> crooks and... Um, uh, Lansbury had to fight at home against the ratepayers who didn't want the rates to go up to pay for the children and to fight the NIMBYs in Brentwood who didn't want these scruffy oiks in their um, in their territory, in their area. They were successful and this became uh, the, the um, almost a template for good orphanages this along with Barnardo's which is a separate story I could talk about at some other stage uh, for the 20th century and, and became the basis of a lot of institutionalized state um, 20th century child childcare in Britain it by by within five years of opening it got praise from the very kind of inspectors who condemned the private uh, the Forest Gate institution that ran there 20 years previously and it got a royal seal of approval uh, by a visit in the in, in 1918 and was, was was held up as being the ideal state institution so that uh, is the Forest Gate institution um, at, and uh, the, 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 the place itself uh, later became a maternity hospital. <laughs> this is a photo of the staff in, in the 1950s, which you will note are to a person white and very different from the complexion uh, profile of um, our hospital staff these days. Uh, meanwhile, uh, and in the ground, so the after it ceased to be um, a hospital, it's become um, social housing, largely the London and Quadrant uh, Housing Association. In the ground, there's a park there. In the grounds of the park are memorials on the left to the fire and on the right to its role as a maternity hospital. So uh, elsewhere, in to, to, to come to the... Uh, the, the the more local to um, St Peter's reference. This was a picture, a map of the East London Boards of Guardians in 1896. Almost all of them had facilities, childcare facilities, in schools outside of <coughs> uh, the the area in Essex, in what was then Essex. So Hackney had a place in Brentwood. Uh, Shoreditch had a place in Hornchurch, White Tuffel and Poplars at the time were in uh, Forest Gate, St George's in the East, which effectively um, is what we would call Wapping today. Their children were in in, in Plashet in Forest Gate. Those of you know what used to be or, 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 um, the old Ace Cinema, now a largely um, Asian a series of Asian uh, vegetable shops. Mile End and Stepney's children for a, a, a series of reasons were looked after 
by Bernardo's in Barking side, uh, which left Bethnal Green, which had um, didn't have uh, a, a, a place in Essex until uh, eighteen sixty. Uh, sorry, 1868 when they bought this place which was originally owned by the Buxton family uh, who uh, perhaps best known, you know, Quakers best known for um, uh, the abolition of their, their work in the uh, slavery abolition movement um, or um, and, and that, that, that's the photo of the building I took um, few months ago uh, and the, you can see the blue plaque on it which is here uh, uh, for, uh, um, North of Forest recognised listed building um, uh, the institution in Forest Gate isn't listed by anybody either by English Heritage and is barely recognised by Newham Council whereas at least uh, North of Forest recognise the role that this place played. Um, to go through its history a little bit, um, it was uh, it's, it, so it's established in what is now effectively the Green Man Roundabout. The main house here, uh, when it was taken over in 1868, became the administrative headquarters and all the buildings at the back which were part of the um, the Gurney buildings were flattened initially and replaced by temporary wooden buildings <clears throat> um, the, uh, the 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 Buxtons were paid 9,500 for their property um, <laughs> and um, the temporary uh, iron buildings were, 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 were built there to uh, accommodate upwards of 400 children. Um, the iron buildings uh, initially housed dormitories um, and school accommodation. It was an absolutely disastrous start for the school. Its first year uh, with almost echoes of what was going on in Forest Gate. In its first year the superintendent and the matron were both sacked, the superintendent for persistent drunkenness and the matron for uh, cruelty to the children. From 1869 onwards, however, it had a much more settled um, life, um, much more stable life and conditions there were far superior to those in the Forest Gate School. Um, these these buildings were soon built. Were built in the nineteen in, in the eighteen eighties. Those on the left were the schools and uh, training facilities. Those on the right were the dormitories for the boys and the girls. Clearly, much more like houses than um, the barracks at Forest Gate. There were uh, the children were in uh, dormitories of, of 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 twelve. There were four dormitories in each. Each house, each house also had play areas. Each had their own um, uh, kitchens and so on. So much closer to the uh, kind of conditions that Lansbury and <coughs> uh, Crooks were able to establish in uh, in Brentwood uh, twenty years later. Um, like <coughs> uh, the um, and, and, and the, 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 the Brentwood, uh, sorry, the um, Leightonstone School, the Bethnal Green School in, in uh, Leightonstone took up with the Barnett's idea and uh, ensured that all of their girl leavers were looked after by the um, Metropolitan Association for the Befriending of Young Servants. More child-centric uh, facilities were, were provided there. Um, and each of the houses was run not by an ex-army sergeant, but as later in um, <coughs> uh, Brentwood, uh, were run by house mothers. Uh, the school also had swimming baths, an outside gymnasium uh, and a laundry. The uh, um, facility remained uh, there as a school after the, the Forest Gate one moved out into um, 
uh, in, in, into Essex and children continued <coughs> to go to the school on the on the left there in, in Leytonstone until 1904. From 1904 onwards they were uh, bit by bit moved into local schools and mixed freely with uh, with other local children in the area so, so the stigmatization and the, the the separation from the rest of society was was um was ruptured in in in, in, in 1904 it continued however as an orphanage with uh, upwards of 400 people in it uh, upwards of 400 children in it uh, until the 1930s uh, uh, when it uh, uh, when it transferred uh, from Bethnal Green's uh, control to uh, the London County Councils, the LCC continued to run it as an orf an orphanage with uh, 400 children from the ages of two until 15 until uh, 1937, when it closed um, and the children were moved to other facilities elsewhere in Essex, and the building was taken over and became the Leighton Stone House Hospital for people with learning difficulties. Uh, it remained as such until 1994 when it was closed and um, operates now uh, <laughs> largely as the large Tesco building from the Green Man Roundabout. Uh, so that's it from me. Um, as a quick reminder, that is my book, which was published uh, about a month ago, available twelve ninety nine from all good bookshops and from the um, big river that runs in South America. <laughs> um, uh, or you can get hold of it from me if you'd like via email at my home address, uh, at that um, um, email address. So thank you for your attendance. I will be more than happy to... Uh, take any questions any of you may have uh, on anything I've spoken about or anything that you feel may be vaguely related and that I could assist with. So thank you. Over to you. Uh, I guess you have to go through uh, Francis unless he's able to unmute everybody. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm going to keep you all muted, I'm afraid, but I'm very, very happy <clears throat> to ask some questions. So I do write questions into the chat box if you'd like to to ask John anything. Um, John, I just want to say a massive thanks for your absolutely fascinating presentation there. Um, I particularly enjoyed the sort of context that you set to the, you know, the arisal of the workhouse as an institution. I thought that was really fascinating. Um, your vivid description of life in one of these institutions um, and also some of the illustrations used along the way particularly those of the children in the 1890s um, in Whitechapel, sort of really helped kind of drive home the conditions that these young people were forced to live in. Um, I've got a few questions of my own, sort of in advance of other people posting theirs in. Actually, no, sorry, we did get a good question from a, a, a Sarah or a Sarah. So I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. Um, and they ask, were parents informed of children's deaths in the workhouse? So I think that was particularly in the context of the fire um, at the Forest Gate School. Um, but also, I guess, more generally, if, if the children died while under care, would, the, ch would be the parents be informed or I suppose siblings as well? well it, it, specifically about the fire, um, it's quite interesting. The, the, the local um, Stratford Express, uh, published an article about the fire. I mean, it, a, a lengthy article, um, and that um, I'm, I'm not sure parents were directly informed. But what happened was that that article was widely uh, circulated in the areas covered by the school, and the superintendent at the school, a guy called Charles Duncan, called. I mean, this is quite extraordinary. Called in the journalist uh, who, who wrote the story and gave him an enormous rollicking uh, for what he described as sensational journalism because it impacted adversely on Duncan. 
And Duncan's line was, you've written up this story so badly that my office door has been knocked down by a series of parents coming from as far away as Whitechapel wanting to know if their child was among the dead. Uh, the parents weren't told directly. Uh, they found, you know, parents of children in the school found out from the press about the fire. The parents of the dead, of the, those who were smothered, uh, weren't directly notified. Uh, and the parents had to knock down the doors of the school to find out if it was their child who, who were among them. Under normal circumstances, the, 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 the children in the school, uh, the, the parents wouldn't have been told directly by the school if children died there. And there was a very high death rate. The death rate of children in that school, bearing in mind we're talking about children from the age of two to the age of 15, normally among the healthier sections of society, the death rate there was twice that per thousand of the population of Whitechapel as a whole. Um, children, the parents of children there who weren't told directly, the, uh, the school told the Board of Guardian from which the children came, uh, passed on the message to them and left it to the Board of Guardian to get in touch with the parents. And it was, you know, it was dependent on how quickly, how speedy they were. But, you know, maybe the parents had moved on. There was no guarantee that the grieving parent or the, the, the parents of dead children would find out any time soon that their child had died and certainly not uh, in, 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 in time for there to be a them to attend the pauper's funeral. Hmm, that's shocking really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, Karen asks, where could you locate the names of children that perished in the fire? Um, and if they would have been laid to rest in the grave? Uh, <laughs> the names of, <laughs> the names of all the children that perished in the fire are in my book. Um, but, uh, you can you, you can um, find them without having. I don't, I don't, I'm now doing myself a great disservice, but you can find, you can find them if you go to the blog that I run, uh, which is www.e7-nowandthen.org. Um, so the blog will come up on the left-hand column. There is a search engine. If you put in workhouse fire an article will come up um, about the fire and you can find the names of the 26 children there um, but a much easier way is actually to just go out and spend 12.99 on the book <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so they are yeah they, 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 they are uh, reasonably easily accessible um, and uh, if neither of those routes um, appeal to you, you can get a copy of the Stratford Express um, in January 1891, uh, sorry, in 1890 uh, on microfiche in Newham Library and through the British Newspaper Archives and the names are there. So they are accessible and on the public record. Excellent, thanks John. Um, I'm sure those links to do further research, especially your book, will be very gratefully received by um, attendees tonight. You mentioned um, when you were talking about the death rate, obviously you reminded us of the fact that the children there were, you know, admitted from the age of two. I was just wondering if there was any sort of notion of a, a sort of kindergarten system for the very uh, youngest of children. There, 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 there were three... Um main areas in the school one one for boys over the age of nine one for girls over the age of nine and the third one which was called the nursery as soon as the children got to the school they were put into the appropriate grouping uh, and didn't see anybody outside that grouping uh, unless they you know through a, a reasons of age moved so you know if, if you were an eight-year-old or two-year-old child and you had a 
an eight-year-old or nine-year-old brother and a ten-year-old sister, you wouldn't see them until you moved up and into the appropriate place. So the the the, the, the nursery area had a different uh, curriculum, and clearly there were nursery nurses in there to look after the the younger children and to care for them. Uh, in in less uh, well, I, I'm not suggesting they were well uh, cared for, but clearly the two year olds weren't set to scrub the floors and peel the potatoes. But uh, quite how well they were uh, cared for is uh, is questionable, really. Again, no, you know, none of those that looked after the nursery assistants, as they were known, uh, were on dreadful money. There was a huge turnover because the money was so poor none of them was ever uh, trained and you know usually there were only 17 or 18 year old uh, girls anyway that were looking after them so you know it, 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 in some cases it was child leavers from the school who just transferred over and um, you know just became child carers rather than a, a child attendee mm. so not 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 child care or nursery uh, conditions as any of us would uh, know or expect them to be yeah yeah care very much uh in inverted commas I suppose. yeah yeah care, care was a, a word unknown in the school really i think talking about the staffing you mentioned that um a lot of the staff who worked there were drawn from sort of ex-soldiers i was just wondering if you if you could explain any of the sort of wider context of that i mean if you left the army were there other jobs or roles that you could find quite easily in society, or was it a fairly tough life for um, the demobilised? Well, I, 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 I think it was. Um, it, it would have been fairly tough, but most of them did leave on a fifty percent pension. So you might have left the army age fifty and had a pension, <clears throat> which was rare for most people at the time. So I'm not suggesting that any of them was well off. Um, but many of them were able to supplement their pensions with with other work and maintain you know by standards of the day average type um, uh, standards of living uh, the, the, the point about there the being ex soldiers was was, was not that you know, the score wasn't so much that there was a, a plethora of ex soldiers around it was more that uh, the governors of the school explicitly sought ex-soldiers in order to, because what they were interested in doing was inculcate discipline, and it's by discipline and the iron rod that you'll cease to be feckless and go out and get a proper bloody job. You know, none of this namby pamby looking after the kids stuff. You know, a bit of tough love never hurt anybody, and this is and and that 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 was. Um, almost the um, attitude of of those running workhouse schools it, it elsewhere. I mean, they were disciplined, brutal places where, you know, corporal punishment was, was common and um, ignored or, or um, uh, tolerated by, you know, there was supposed to be a punishment book, which was... Um, uh, accessible to governors and the local government board, the poor law board. Uh, well, people just you know went in there and said, you know, I gave a, you know, child X eight lashings today because he was rude to me. Well, there was rarely, if ever, any um, a comeback to to, to 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 that brutal behaviour. So, um, you know, and, and these conditions, you know, the institutionalised conditions, you know, far from preparing people for life in wide, wider society became, you know, almost like prisons today. They, <laughs> those living in them knew nothing about the institution. So when they got back, they became recidivists, often just seeking the sanctuary of an institution because that was the only kind of life they understood. You know, people who, who leave prison and go back in prison aren't often doing it. Don't, um, as a result of, 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 of criminal activity, it's often because they want to go back to what they understand to be their home conditions, really. And so it was here. You know, many of those that left 
so you ended up back in the workhouse anyway because they were the only conditions they knew and understood. The notion of a loving, caring family, sharing a household with a partner, uh, was, was alien. Mm. Particularly <clears throat> um, thinking about those tough conditions, you, you spoke about um, the poor law inspectors who visit these schools mm. and, you know, clearly given... <clears throat> Some of the things you mentioned, particularly to do with the food as well. Um, could, could you just explain a bit more what, what the role of these inspectors were? Because it well, looks well, like well, very lax. Yeah, the, 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 poor, the poor law board uh, operated as a, as a government department. And it was incredibly bureaucratic. I mean, uh, in order to do this, to, to, to write a book, I, I, you know, I accessed a huge amount of um, records in the archives, and basically there is there is an enormous amount of, of, of records relating to the school from the perspective of the school in the London Metropolitan Archives, which is in Clerkenwell. You, you have registers of children, correspondence of the. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the superintendent uh, undertook um, employment records of the staff. There was an enormous number, a range of staff, um, to high turnover. All of their records are there. Creed registers, admission registers of the children. All of that is in the London Metropolitan Archives. And in the, the, uh, the, the Poor Law Board Archives, um, <clears throat> which are exist in the the National Archives in Kew. Again, huge, huge numbers, uh, volumes of, 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 of archives, all the correspondence relating to the school, uh, correspondence between the poor law board, civil servants and the school and others, reports, da 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 it was, and, and it's all there. The, the poor law board had employed poor law board inspectors who went down to, to examine the school and uh, would send critical reports of the school. They went back to the poor law board, but it did nothing. And so those running the school know that, you know, there may be critical reports of them, but there were no sanctions ever imposed. They, you know... <laughs> The fact that they were culpable for the fire and for the food poisoning was known by the poor law board, but no sanctions were in, in, imposed because those running the poor law board didn't wish to be seen to be undermining the authority of those running the local institution. So there was notional control, but effectively it was their... Um, it, 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 it was never imposed and so and, and equally the local poor law boards that ran the schools and the governors that ran the schools turned blind eye to this because they wanted to see discipline imposed at the lowest possible cost I mean none of these things were conducive to the interests of the children and bluntly nobody was greatly interested in the children. They wanted to get rid of a social problem as cost effectively as possible and that social problem was feeding and looking after kids uh, until they could be let loose on the streets to uh, to fend for themselves. Mm. Were, were there sanctions that were open to the, um, the poor law system? I mean, exercise, I mean yeah. you, know, you know, very occasionally, um, um, sanctions were undertaken. But in, in that, in, in a phrase that often runs through the BBC, you know, when problems exist, it's often said at the BBC, deputy heads will roll. In other words, those ultimately responsible escape, but it's those further down the line that pay the price. Now, bizarrely, uh, in, and there are a number of uh, instances of this that I you know, illustrate in the book, uh, whistleblowers of bad behaviour at the school were dismissed, while the perpetrators of the bad behaviours uh, continued to be employed. Uh, in instances of dreadful brutality, the poor law board would often intervene uh, and say, 
no, this is terrible. What are you doing about it? And the superintendent would say, oh, sorry, I didn't know about it. And the perpetrator of brutal violence, and there was you know, physical violence often resulted in hospitalisation. The perpetrator, the immediate perpetrator, may have been uh, dismissed, but the superintendent res responsible for overseeing the staff would shrug his shoulders and say, well, oh, nobody told me about it. And that was found to be acceptable. None of those managing the school, none of those in charge of the school for the first 50 years of its uh, existence was sacked. And, you know, the poor law board knew about this stuff going on. Hmm. Well, well, thank you so much for answering those questions, John, and also for your, your fascinating talk.